This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Noel Wilcox. Noel, how are you? I'm very well. Good to meet you, James. Yeah, good to see you. You're here to expose child maintenance. You're seeing a lot of suicide. There's over three billion pounds went missing. A lot of dark stuff, a lot of corruption, which we'll touch on. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good, mate. Thanks for coming on the show. It's good weather in London for a change. I'm surprised. It's been a bit of a mad summer. Mm. But sun's out, mate, so everybody's happy. My God, what on earth was July about? The it's weather. T- terrible. It's been awful, hasn't it? It was if I was back in Scotland. <laughs> Before we get into everything, but I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get mm-hmm. a bit of understanding about you, know where you grew up and how it all began. Mm-hmm. Right, okay, so my name is Noel Wilcox, and I grew up in Swiss Cottage in London. Grew up on a council estate. What else you want to know? How was that? Um, it was very tough, very tough. You know, you had to learn, you know, how to survive on the streets and stuff like that. I remember there was an estate just down the road called Rowley Way very, very dangerous, you know, so you had to have your wits about you. Nothing like what it is nowadays, but yeah, it was quite, quite something growing up in London. What were you like at school? Not very good, if I'm honest about it. I was a bit naughty. Um, I actually did get expelled from school for fighting. So yeah, I wasn't particularly good. What about parents? Um, My mum brought me up. Um, My dad left when I was 18 months old. And yeah, we you know, we kind of struggled, lived in council flats and stuff like that. Then my mum got a good break. She started wor- working for Vodafone and flew up the chain very quickly in Vodafone. So yeah, then life started progressing, started getting better. It's funny though, all the broken homes and missing fathers that kids end up expelled or involved in violence or prison or they end up in the porn industry. It's with the broken home, it's the ma- the, the, the the big percentage of kids being bad it has a massive effect did, did you think that affected you as a kid your father not being there definitely definitely gave me demons you know a hundred hundred million percent it gave me de- demons and i had to go through quite a few journeys you know to try and get my head right because i couldn't understand why i was in destructive relationships etc etc um and that's a very interesting point that you've just brought to the table there regarding you know the amount of young men that have come from broken homes. Do you know what the actual statistic is of the amount of men and boys that are currently in prison? It's a 60% or something. 76, yeah. 76%. It's, it's a huge problem. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a massive, massive problem. And I think just as a society, we've lost our way of actual family values. Why do you think that's broken down? <sighs> because I think the emphasis in our lives at the moment is all about making money and somewhere along the line we've actually forgotten what it is to just come from you know families what family life is all about you know life is meant for living not existing Mm -hmm. and definitely in the uk you know it's this fast pace that we've got of society but also as well there's no support mechanisms out there for families for broken homes etc etc you know it's all very very one-sided 
a lot of research you know yeah, i just feel as if it's getting worse now you've got social media you've got dating apps back in the day 60s 70s 80s people met it was a lived on the street maybe or the local pub and they worked to their relationship it might have been painful but they never broke they were married at 17 18 they raised a family four five six kids now you've got people single girls in the 40s 50s 30s 40s and they don't really want kids they don't want family but i just feel as if they think the world's overpopulated i think there's not enough people on it if i'm honest but again i'm not so sure if i'm right but it just seems as if the family morals and when you talk about the prison stats of over 70 percent coming from a broken home the figures are there mm. it's so important to have a mum and dad and if i've got kids to different women so it's but i know i'm a good dad and i'm there but it still could affect them no matter how good I'm doing. How, like, how many how many children have two, you got? Oh, you've son got and two, a daughter, yeah. two different women. Right, okay. Yeah. So, but I'm there. at my job. I would be down London full time if I never had my kids back home. If they're 12 and 13, they need their dad. I know with these figures and stats and I spoke to enough people, the father not being there, it fucks them up. But I believe mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever you want to call it. I just believe as a father, my duty is, is to be with my family and as a, you want to be alpha, and everybody talks about masculinity and alpha. The most alpha thing you can do is take care of your family. I I I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I really couldn't. And like you say, it's it's, it's become quite quite sad in society in society at the moment. And I think definitely one of the reasons why we're witnessing this kind of social devastation that we're seeing at the moment amongst our communities is because mum and dad are not in you know, that, that child's life. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, that's what I think. What did you do after school? Um, just kind of, kind of bum jobs, you know, I've always worked. Um, funny enough, I started off as a waiter at Pizza Hut when I was 16 years old, um, which was quite interesting. Uh, what, just washing dishes, that sort of stuff, Pizza Hut. Um, I started getting involved with security, you know, I started working doors, started doing bits and pieces like that. I joined the army reserves and that took me on a different journey. What age were you? I was 18, 18 when I joined the army reserves and it was probably one of the best things that I ever did. You how's, know, how's all? Um, life experience. And I, I do firmly believe that the morals and the values that the army instilled into me has made me the man that I am now. Missing father kind of thing where you've got some structure. Exactly. A bit of structure in my life, bit of, um, yeah, motivation made me realize so many things. It gives you that real kind of like mental robustness that you can get through very tough times. You know, they make it tough in the British Army. My God, you know, some of the courses that you go on and stuff like that are absolutely horrendously hard. The sleep deprivation. Yeah the wet weather, the cold, particularly when you go to places like Brecon, it's, it is absolutely horrible. I had some of the SAS men on and they're mad as fuck. <laughs> like, because the British Army haven't got, they're not that, there's not that many troops mm. compared to India or Japan or Russia, but they're the strongest, I believe, because they're fucking nuts. And the training, the SAS guys, that aren't the, the stuff that they do and the stories that they were telling me off camera, I'm thinking, what the fuck? People don't even know. People don't know half of it. We only see what's on the news, but then that's all bullshit. But the stories that they were saying, the stuff that they have to see, I don't, for me personally, I don't agree with wars, but again, they happen. Who else is going to serve and protect if people were to invade or whatever? But the more I got into it, because I went to join the Marines as a kid. Really? Yeah. Why the Marines? I don't know. I was. I spoke to a guy, and he just he says the training, and he says, and he just looked in great shape. And I thought, fuck, it, I'm going to join. And I went down to the local place in Glasgow, done the test and everything. And I was, I think, I was to go away for six weeks. But I can't remember for training somewhere, and I, I, I end up fuck going fuck that for some reason. But I wanted to go to the Marines. I it, just it, looked for a now. I just wanted some stability. I wanted, like you say, structure. I felt as if I was slipping. Then the football career was going, and I just thought, man, I'm. And then the drugs started coming in, and I just thought I need a away from here because I felt it was a, a slipping, and I did slip for a good twelve years. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think definitely the system, the way that the British Army kind of like operates, you know, its structure, 
you know, how we always keep to the basics, whether you're special forces, whether you're infantry, whether you're raw logistics or whatever it might be. It's just the structure that you always stick to the basics. And then when you go off and you do specialist sort of training for, you know, whether it's operations or courses or whatever it might be, um, you know, those fundamentals, the building blocks are already there. So it's kind of quite easy to go off and do that. And my God, the fitness is just, it's crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy hard. But I've interviewed, like I say, so many men from, and the sniper as well, uh, Craig Harrison, he mad, he done the world's longest sniper kill. But just so fascinating, but it's fascinating also how their minds go. Mm. The SAS guys, I noticed, they were, they never really gave a fuck. The snipers and stuff, I've seen the struggle. I think, they, I don't know what sort of training you get in the SAS, but Chris Ryan I had on and he was just, he just looks happy. Mm. He just looks as if, fuck it. And that takes us, because it's, it's it's not a humane thing to see destruction. Kids dying or people dying, it's not normal. But a lot of these people see this, but some of them have, who did I have on the guy? He was supposed to kill Escobar. Um, Scottish guy. Oh, uh, McAleese. McAleese, mm. uh, Peter. I went to interview Peter and he's just an old guy sitting in the old folks home just loving life. Mad. But yeah, I've interviewed people who's on the dark side, can't get out. Craig Harrison said to me, I would rather be in a war zone because I feel more at peace than mm -hmm. I do actually in peace. And I thought, wow, just used to madness, just used to that. I don't know what sort of adrenaline it is to kill someone, but he used to get like, women and kids walking and he's got that call to make that call so he doesn't know if they're suicide bombers and that's some dark stuff. But people don't realise what people actually go through and I've got nothing but mass respect for anybody who serves that's their decision. That's because I was going to, like I say, going to join the Marines mm -hmm. and I don't know how my life would have been, but I just obviously, I speak to enough people now and I think of the destruction and then you talk about Iraq and all this stuff and there was no weapons. I'm like, what was it all for then? Did you ever question it when you were in there at a the time or were you just so loving life that you had a bit of stability and some structure in your life? You know, I, th I think with a soldier, it's, it's not for us to question, mm -hmm. you know, why we're there. You know, you swear that oath. You swear that oath of allegiance. Um, you know, and obviously at the time it was, you know, to Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and that's when I believe when I joined the army, you know, the values that this country really stood for, you know, um, in terms of our constitution, in terms of how we were structured as a country. And that's the reason why I joined and swore that oath. Um, the story of weapons and mass destruction, uh, you know, it, it, it's a story that I think is just going to go on for a very, very long time. Well, you know, were we supposed to be there? Weren't we? I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, but soldiers just follow those orders and soldiers can't be blamed for going out and doing the job where we've sworn that oath to do that because somebody's got to do it. Yeah, that's what I say. I have nothing but respect for soldiers because I know how dark it is. But when you swear by that oath, you're just there to take orders. You're just signing up because you feel as if this is a thing that I should be doing, I'm here to serve and protect. So I totally understand that. It's just when you start looking at it from the outside and the corruption of the government, you think, fuck me, look at all those innocent fucking brothers dying for, for what, I question that. And I think hopefully they've not been fucked over because people genuinely believe they've got a purpose to do the right thing, to serve and protect. And that's takes so much courage to be willing to die for something that you believe in. And that's the ultimate courage, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've raised a valid point there. You know, you swear that oath of allegiance and just in your mind, you know, at that time, Saddam Hussein was the threat, mm -hmm. you know, in, it was called Optelic, by the way, you know, when it was the Iraq war. So he was the threat at that time. So that's what we trained specific to do. Whatever role you were fulfilling, you know, when you're in Iraq, that role is what you train to go and do. And Beyond that, you didn't really think any more or any less than what you were actually specifically tasked to do. And to be honest with you, at that time when you're going out there on operations, <laughs> your main thing is I need to come back alive and I need to keep everyone around me alive. And that's kind of what you're more focused on. Yeah. How is it seeing people that you love die? I personally haven't experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did see some stuff whilst I was on operations that I had to deal with when I came back. Um, 
you know, I think this word PTSD now is just kind of like a soundbite for when someone's having a bad day or whatever it might be. Um, you know, actually getting those night tremors, the smells, the the heat sometimes that you, you know, it's different experiences that you would have when you're actually serving on operations and you're consistently living under stress. Every day when you're going out that gate, you're living under stress. You don't know if you're coming back that day. You know, sometimes there might be mortar attacks during the night. You can hear the mortar bombs coming in and you're like, oh my God, where is that going to land? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then there might be an explosion maybe three, 400 meters away from where you are. So I think it's just the stress of the environment. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Of being there. But then the flip side to the coin is, it's quite peaceful, Does if that makes sense. It's, it can be quite peaceful mm -hmm. because the only thing that you've got to worry about is what's in front of you. Not all the stresses and the headache of what you get back here, back home. You know, out there, you, you, you're kind of left to your own devices. You know, you've got the protection on you to do that job or to do that task. And the only thing really that you need to worry about is obviously coming home and keeping everyone around you safe. How long were you a soldier for? I'm still part of the army reserves now. I can't let it go. <laughs> Why is that? I just can't I, I, I can't, I just can't see myself living my life without having that there. You know, I'm 48 now. I you mean, what, good for 48. Oh, thank you very much. But I mean, I, I, I just can't let it go. It's, it's a part of my life that I just can't let go. You just like the madness. Like you say, you feel at peace. I feel at peace. Yeah. And so what as army reserves, what's the duties then? Do you, can you get a call up anytime? Yeah. So what they did is they amalgamated, uh, it was the old TA Mm -hmm. you know, and they amalgamated the TA into the regular army. And now you've basically just got one that's full-time and one that's part-time. You know, they both have to, we both have to achieve the same uh, training standards. You know, we get paid the same. Obviously you only get paid for what you do um, and you get paid uh, per your rank. So whatever your ranking structure is, you get paid. Um, and then you get a bounty every sort of every year. Um, you know, you get your MOD 90 card. There is, there is literally no difference. You know, you get full access to all the military kind of stuff that the regular army do. The only thing that you don't get is dental. Do you think, do you think with the way society is now, there'll be another war? Or do you think it's more like chemical and do you think it's different from World War One, World War Two, where people have got the guns and they're, they're battling or do you feel as if... I see a lot of instability in the world. Mm-hmm. And the weirder something is nowadays, I think that's our new reality and we need to accept that. You know, some of the stuff that's spoken about, you're like, really? Where, where has that come from? And I just see a lot of instability in the world. I don't see any great leaders in the world currently, you know, who are in top positions. Um, it's all comical, the readers, the fucking weird cartoon characters. It's mad. There's nobody you go out, do you know what? I don't like hoarders myself. I, I'm not a man who, I like to be a leader, mm -hmm. but I just feel as if there's nobody you can really go, do you know what? He sounds as if he's got it figured out. Everything just seems a big game for money and the elite, where just keep the rich rich and the poor poorer. How strong is the British Army um, compared to others? It's woeful absolutely woeful so what could we ever be invaded yeah yeah i mean yeah massively um you know it has come out recently that currently as it stands at the moment the british army would not be able to fill half a football stadium in the premier league but then what doesn't make sense to me is we're just importing all these men are fighting age. And our British army has been absolutely decimated. It just, just doesn't make sense to me. Why is it, why is it so powerful then? Britain? So what, what? Just powerful. There's a powerful nation, don't you think? <laughs> well, they've invaded fucking 
over ninety percent of the world. Why is it become, why was it so powerful compared to other populations and other armies? Because of that military structure. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at um you look at Sandhurst, you know, that's where all the officers go. Uh, it, real intensive training. Uh, I can't remember how long it is at Sandhurst. You know, it's the structure, it's the education, it's the, it, it's it's that military attitude that you have to adopt, you know. And then you look at the way that you're structured throughout, you join the army as a private soldier, then you're assessed at whether or not you're going to go down the kind of non-commissioned officer's route as a leader or you're going to go kind of into the stores that decision's made you know what path you're going to take so you're either going to go kind of go down the tactics route or they'll look at you and think you know what you're a lot better as a stores person or whatever it might be you know because that's where you're going to be efficient and that's how you're going to work so you've, you've been doing this for 30 years in and out part-time now yeah 28 28 years i've just recently had to take a leave of absence because you know i've got so much on at the moment you know i've got a scaffolding company as well um so that's very busy doing really well um and there are other th projects that i'm kind of working on at the moment so i just had to take that leave of absence because i'll be honest with you james i started feeling a bit overwhelmed mm -hmm. so let's touch on the main reason why you're here today the child maintenance stuff mm -hmm. so when did it wasn't child maintenance back was it 1992 93 when it all started so in 1993 um it was the inception of the child support agency yeah, um, which is known, m most people would know it as the CSA. So that was, that became live in 1993. So what was their main purpose? To get money off the mail or to get money off the parent who wasn't there? How, how did it all start and what was the, the process of actually all being there? Okay, so the process was when, when it all came live, mm -hmm was that when a resident parent was receiving benefits, a condition of that benefits was that they had to give the name of the non-resident parent. That's how that came, because what they wanted to do, if they were paying benefits, what they wanted to do is recoup the money back into the treasury. Does that... Yeah, of course. Yeah. So they're, wanting, they're giving yeah. free money, not free money, but they're giving people money and they wanted to claim some of it back. Yeah, and they wanted to claim some of that money back. So that was a condition of that. But also they also ran a scheme where um, the resident parent could also contact the agency to carry out an assessment on their partner, ex-partner, wherever it might be. What percentage of the UK pay child maintenance? Currently at the moment, they're near about the million mark. It's near, it fluctuates from year to year from what I've seen from about three quarters of a million to up to a million. But we're quite high at the moment. We're into about the million mark, I think. How many of them do you know are on uh, support? That I, that I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know how many people are on um, income support or on benefits or, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. I, I don't really see so that sort of data. So people that are coming from every month? A million, near enough a million people? Yeah, roughly, roughly about, we're, we're really close to about that million mark at the moment. I think we're about 960,000. So cases. what made you look into all this? Um, through my own experience, to be honest with you. What um, happened? I was refused contact with my daughter um, for no reason whatsoever. And I couldn't understand, you know, there was just too many answer, unanswered questions. You know, I'm a man who served my country. I've got no criminal convictions. I've got my own business. I've got my own property. And I can't see my child. Why is that? And then an assessment was made against me. And I had this random number that came through the door. I tried to appeal it. I tried to go through all the process. And nothing got absolutely nowhere. Just You're just ignored. Con consistently ignored. What did you do? Went to my MP. Uh, he tried a little bit. He just tried to help a little bit, but it just became a repetitive thing. Oh, I've sent a letter. I've sent a letter. I've sent a letter. Why don't you pick up the phone and actually ask somebody, how have you come to these figures? So um, they obtained a liability order against me um, and they tried to send me to prison back in March 2022. For what? 
for non-payment of child maintenance. How much? Uh, I think the liability order currently sits at about seven and a half thousand pounds. How long did you get prison for? It's a sanction. Remand? No, it's a sanction. Stay in prison until you've... No, 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 no. So it's a sanction. So the maximum is six weeks that right. they can give you in prison. Um, or they can remove your passport, your driving license. They can freeze your bank accounts. They can go into your bank account and take any amount of money without a court order, which they try to do. They try to raid my bank account um, with absolutely no paperwork affiliated to them doing that because I did a subject access request with NatWest. Um, they can secure the money through a DEO, which is a direct earnings order. Um, and that's pretty much their enforcement powers, but they're very, very harsh enforcement powers. How do they get that sort of power? Obviously, you've got HMRC with tax and they've got some sort of power, but I believe they've got more power than HMRC. Is that they've correct? They've got more power than any government department in the United Kingdom. Why is that? I believe because it's big business. I believe that child support, child maintenance is big business from the data that I've read. Do you believe they maybe use kids against the parents to make money from the parents? 100%. How so? So if you encourage the non-resident parent not to see that child and there's court orders preventing you from seeing that child, then it's all one-way traffic. They can take the money from the non-resident parent, whereas if you've got 50-50 shared care, that's divided, isn't it? So it's in their interests to cause that chaos from the family courts to the child maintenance service. Is this all in favour of the female? Majority of the time? The majority of the time, yes, it is. And I get asked this question an awful lot. And the answer to it is, why does it favour the woman? Um, the reason for that is, is the way that the child benefit laws are written which is currently being ch challenged in the High Court at the moment because it's discriminatory towards fathers. Do you feel as if there should be more protection for the fathers? Yeah, definitely. Um, there should be a lot better appeals procedures um, and definitely accountability. From what I've seen with the Child Maintenance Service, they have absolutely no accountability whatsoever. They are a completely rogue organisation who just make up their own rules as they go along. You talk about, um, before we spoke, about over £3 billion pounds going missing. What was that? £3 billion pounds hasn't gone missing. So what's happened is the old child support agency, because they didn't have the access to the technical data that they have nowadays, mm -hmm. where they could go direct to HMRC and obtain a figure from HMRC. So what they would do is they would inflate your income by 300%. So make out you're making more than what you are. A lot more. And they use that as a lever to scare you, the paying parent, into contacting them. So that was a matter of course that they used that tactic. So HMRC used to use that tactic, but what they used to do was make the corrections. So once you got into contact with HMRC and you cleared up whatever it is that you owe them or whatever it might be, they would make those necessary corrections. Whereas with the child support agency, they never made those corrections on those balances. Yeah, because we talk about suicide is high with these sort of cases as well, child maintenance, people struggling and they, they can't take the pressure. What sort of scare tactics do they do? So by inflating that income, you know, you, the first thing that you're going to look at it because it's got, it's got the crown seal on it, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, well, hold on a minute. I earn that. I earn £20,000 a year. Why am I being assessed on £60,000 a year? So your automatic reaction is to contact the agency and give them the correct data. So that's what paying parents were doing, giving them the correct data. But what they weren't doing was making the necessary changes or correcting those calculations. And on that account, so let's say, for instance, they wanted you to pay £100 a week. They would assess you on £300 a week. What would happen is you would start paying that £100 a week, but they never made that correction of that £200 a week. And what would happen is that would just keep growing in the accounts balance, 
which is known as the 1993 and the 2003 schemes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know that this was the tactic that they were employing because Noel Shanahan, who was the director of the child maintenance service in the oral hearings with the public account, sorry, the public accounts committee, he basically gave that evidence that that was what they were doing. And he said there's severe question marks over the 3.8 billion. So you, how, so you done six weeks in and No, no, no. They try to send you there for six weeks. Yeah. So is that another scare tactic? Of course it is. Yeah, it is. A, it is another scare tactic. So what I did is I, I, I kept my self assessment right back to the end, which was the correct tax year. So what they did in my case, they cherry picked the income. So the year when I went for my mortgage, which was 2015, 16, they went after that particular tax year. And then the year after, um, you know, I didn't earn as much money. So my tax, my tax had fell and it favored them to use the tax year 2015, 16. So the claim against me was made in September 2017. So logic and common sense would say to you that you need to go back to the tax year 2016, 2017, because that's a, re a true reflection of your income. But they went back to my tax year 2015, 2016. So that was two years prior to that because that was their favoured tax year. Then obviously, the minute that I said to them, well, hold on a minute, that's not my correct income. They said you're non-compliant and then they start whacking on all their fees. So what they run is a service called Collect and Pay, which is where they add 20% onto the amount that they're collecting from you. And then they deduct 4% from the receiving parent. So in total, that amount there, so it suits them for you to be non-compliant because what they're gonna do is, is deduct 24% from the money that they're collecting from you by putting you on to collect and pay. So the money they collect from you is not 100% going to the parent? No, no. And they can take anything up to 24%? Yep, yeah, so, so legally, they can, they're only supposed to take 40% up to 40% of your income because they go in at the gross amount. So it's not even after you've paid your bills or anything like that. So it's really like a stealth tax. So they can take 40% of your income? They can take 40% of your income. Not matter if you've got other kids, mortgage, other bills. So if you're making a grand a month, they can take 400? Exactly. And this happens now? This is happening time and time and time again. And how much did that 400 say? I make a grand a month. They take forty percent. How much does that forty percent go to the mum? So, if you think about the forty percent, they will deduct four four percent from the mother. So, whatever whatever the amount is going to the mother, um, we're saying mother because it is predominantly mothers. But it for for the purposes of this, it's the receiving parent and the non resident parent. So, the receiving parent will receive the money but they've already taken their 20 percent that they've put on top and then they'll deduct four percent does that make sense yeah so if the because i get listen people are struggling and as a father it takes two male and female it takes two to create a kid and as for a mother i know mothers single mothers who struggle and and if a father's working i believe a father should provide and protect no matter if they're in the relationship or not it's a father's duties me now, personally, as I've made changes in my life, I understand the most important thing is my family and to be the right role model and try and lead by example. I get my kids every week. At the start, it was a bit in and out of their lives because I just, I choose partying, I choose the drink, I choose the drugs because I never give a fuck about anybody. Started making changes and I understand now, wait a minute, my kids need me. I interviewed enough people to realise the broken home and the father not being there, it affects them mentally as they got older. So my duty is just to be there, pay my way, so I understand if the child maintenance is there to get money from fathers who just don't want to see their kids, don't take any responsibility. Is, that, could, is there positives from it also, from a mother's side to go, well, wait a minute, he's just got me pregnant, fucked off, doesn't pay anything, I want at least something. We know now, listen, kids are used as weapons. Mm. Mothers can be spiteful and say, well, you're not seeing your kid and they... And, they all, it's always in their favour and if you go to courts it can take months even years and I know a lot of broken fathers who have messaged me and not seen their kids in years are trying to sort it out and it's mothers shouldn't fucking be that way but 
we live in a world where people are spiteful, but we also live in a world where mothers want to protect their kids and some fathers are assholes and deadbeats as well. But is there positives from child maintenance for the single mother just trying to get a bit more money to survive and feed her kids? That's a really, really interesting question. I haven't seen many positives. In theory, the way that the child maintenance service is supposed to work, in theory, it should make sure that the money, the right money, gets to those children. But that's in theory. In reality, the way that it works, from what I've read, all the research that I've done, it just leaves a trail of destruction on both sides. Yeah, because I, I pay direct pay for my son, but I get my son every week as well. Mm. So, But I still get messages from them. It's due here, a payment's due there, but I have no contact because I pay direct. I see my son. Why are they still involved in my life as well? Is that what they're always doing until I think 16 or 18? I think 16 or 18, but I'm, I like to think I'm a good father now. I'll always be there, but why do they still contact? So one would have to question the state involvement. Why are the state interfering in private arrangements? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it suits the state. This high regulation, because we see it everywhere. Everywhere that we go, it's this regulation, regulation. You will do, you will do, or we will do. And they've got the full backing of the law behind them. They've got all this legislation that they're putting through that suits their own agenda. Is this for people who only sign the birth certificate and know they're the father? Or can it be if a woman says, well, he's the dad, can they come for someone who's not on the birth certificate? Uh, yeah, 100% they can come for you. Without DNA? With, without DNA. Because if you look at, if you, we do know of cases where men have been sent to prison um, when they've disputed paternity. And how on earth are they able to obtain the DNA from that child when they don't have contact with that child. So the CMS and the CSA say, well, you can use our laboratories. Mm, would you trust that? So people are paying money, they've never had a DNA and they might not be the dad? A hundred percent. See that, I don't agree but also with. that's on. But that's also on the other side of the coin as well, because some women are affected by this as well because some fathers get custody of the children and then they go after the mother for um child support what's the maximum you pay for child support say there is no is, maximum say, so somebody's making a million a month yeah they can hit them for bigger so for one child you'll pay 12 percent of your salary yeah for one child that's how it's supposed to work i can't remember what the uh, other calculations are i think for two children it might be 16 percent and then it might be 18%. I, I don't have the figures. Monthly? Monthly. It's still a big hit for a lot of people. And it's it's mad to think that people are taking their own life for it. Why is the suicide rate so high with the child maintenance thing? Can we come back to that? Yeah, of course yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, we, yeah. If we come yeah. back to that, because there's a bit, like I say, there's a bit of a story here. Yeah, let's go. You know, that's, um, that's developing. Mm -hmm. um, and very, very recently, uh, Sir Alan Campbell, who is obviously a knight of the realm, he has asked for a public inquiry into the child maintenance service. And what concerns me about this is that none of the media... Nobody has picked this up that he has asked for a public inquiry into the child maintenance service for inaccurate maintenance assessments. Why is that? Do you believe it's all corrupt? It's not for me to say that it's corrupt, you know, but something's not working here. And that's the only way that I can see it. Something is just really wrong and something's not working. That a knight of the realm has asked for a public inquiry in the House of Commons. And it's like this question just hasn't even been asked. And what he's also said is, is that people need to be compensated who have had these inaccurate maintenance assessments against them. Because it's very, very, very relevant. Very relevant. So say child maintenance make up and say, well, you're this, this is the percentage we're taking. 
can anybody can you counter attack it and say, well, wait a minute, that's wrong. These are my pay slips. These are the tax I pay. You can you can do all of that. You can try all of that, and you will be ignored, 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 ignored. It's it's a very very dark hole that the child maintenance service and parents are petrified of this service because of the way that they operate rather than letting two adults come together and discuss what's best for that child how can you have something in place that essentially has become a monster that where the minute that a non-resident parent gets a letter through the door they either stop work and go on to benefits because they know it is a lifetime of hell with this entity it, it does become a lifetime of hell from what i've seen and i've experienced that i've i've experienced five years of sleepless nights of just sheer and utter stress going to prison for a fictitious debt and that is the key word here fictitious because if i bring you back to these interim assessments that were being carried out the arrears balances grew to 3.8 billion pounds so what's happened is when the CSA was closed down in 2012, the child maintenance service came alive. And what they did is they dragged that debt from the old cases of the CSA. They dragged it into the 2012 scheme. And what's been happening and what we've been seeing is that paying parents who are paying for their children all of a sudden will wake up in the morning, go onto their portal, and they will see that they've got thousands of pounds of arrears on their accounts. So what changes then? Sorry, what changes in... How can make people make changes for a better structure and a better, not protection for men, but a better understanding? Because you says about the mums and dads coming together, but you know yourself, people have one night stands, people hate each other, they'll have disagreements, people have affairs... It turns toxic and people don't even want to see each other as parents. So it's difficult to try and have an adult conversation, especially when it comes to something so sensitive as a child. I know many deadbeat fathers who don't even see their kids and they just don't care. So it would be hard for them to get them in a room with the mother. So what do you think could help with a better structure to put things in place where people can get a better understanding of, okay, well, this is where you get paid. At least pay something. It is your kid. Do the right thing. How do you think it gets put in place where there's not enough pressure getting put on someone where people are taking their life, people are going to prison, people are getting much more took off than what they shouldn't? What do you think is a better structure to get in place? Can we come back to that point? Because that is, a, that, is a, that is a very interesting mm -hmm. point. And that is how I would kind of like to summarise mm -hmm. from all of the detail yeah. of, of what's been going on. And, you know, you've mentioned suicides, you've mm -hmm. mentioned... Um, how can we fix this and, and, and stuff like that. And like I say, that's kind of like more how we would summarize mm -hmm. on how we can, I don't necessarily know if we can fix this problem, but we can certainly uh, look to where it's a fairer system. But then one would argue that the child support agency has failed. The child maintenance service is failing. So what is it? Is it the best of three? Do we set something else up for it to fail? For 30 years, this, this system has been running and it just does not work. And we are throwing hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money at a system that just does not work. And it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And the proof is in the pudding. So this debt that they've been distributing amongst paying parents, the very tragic thing about this is that there is no way for a paying parent to challenge these arrears. They get this liability order and then the armory door of enforcement powers opens up. The paying parent cannot see any light at the end of this tunnel. And very, very tragically, they will take their own life. And that is really, really, really tragic. And there's a couple of cases that I've paid a lot of attention to. Um, and one of the cases is Gavin Briggs, who was a young man. He was paying for his children through a court order. Uh, that was all part of the divorce settlement. 
And Gavin took his life a couple of years ago, July, a couple of years ago. And I've spoken to his father on numerous, numerous occasions. Um, they inflated his income to 76, around about 76,000 pounds. You know, he was a train mechanic. They don't earn that sort of money. He was then given 15,900 pounds of arrears on top as well, as well as him already paying for his two children, which was all part of the divorce settlement. When I did the figures, they left him with something like about 120 to 150 pounds a month to live on. He took himself, and it was really, really tough to hear this, you know, and I, I you know, and it, it, it's, it's a very, very sad story, really sad story. He took himself off to a field, bought himself a sandwich, bought um, one of those uh, barbecues that you can transport around, and he lit the barbecue in, in his car and obviously poisoned himself. You've been driven to do that to yourself. Can you imagine what was going through Gavin Briggs's mind? Because he's got no way out of this nightmare. And it has been covered by the media. The actual story was covered by the media. That, that cannot go on. Whether you owe the money or whether you don't owe the money, the state can't have that amount of power to force you to pay a debt that you don't owe where you actually deem that that is the only, the, your only way out is to take your own life. And Ian and the mother, Julia are two just beautiful people. You know, Gavin served his country. He was working, just trying to get on with his life. His father served his country. His mother is a beautiful person. And their lives have been absolutely destroyed by what's happened. Have you seen a lot of cases like this? I've seen so many cases like this. And since I've taken this kind of role on, I've had so many people reaching out to me. And it, it, I mean, these stories are just absolutely tragic. I'll give you another example of a high profile case that was covered by the media as well. It was a case of Johnny O'Neill. He was paying nearly 700 pounds a month for one child. He just wasn't earning that sort of money. He was also given £4,000 of arrears. Do you know what he did? Left a suicide note on Facebook saying that he hopes that he can change the system of the child maintenance service. And he left and he left that note on, on Facebook. And then he tragically took his own life. So is this the pressures of what child maintenance are doing this, to people? The, this is what they're doing. And he, I've, I've listened to the recordings. The family have sent me the recordings because they were able to obtain the recordings from the child maintenance service. A lot of the recordings don't make sense and the recordings are in the wrong order. Surely that's perjury. tampering with evidence a lot of the recordings just don't make any sense to me at all and that's when I look at it is this deliberate or not I you know I don't know what do you think from what I've said to you yeah I don't know it's a weird one it's, it's like I say I pay direct so I've never really had I've had issues where they've I've made more money and they've tried to get more money but I pay more than what they ask for and I just find it all weird that they've got so much power to close accounts and take money and f put people to prison it's it's uh, who is behind it all then who's actually behind it is it the government is it a different is it a private company who's behind it all can i come back to that point because that's yeah. another really really interesting yeah. point as well mm -hmm. so in march 2022 there was another public public accounts committee with Arling Sugden. And who's this? She was the director of the child maintenance service. And she was cross-examined by Debbie Abrahams, who is an MP, about the suicides and the amount of complaints that she'd received regarding the way that clients are being treated. 
And the case of Johnny O'Neill that I just spoke to you about was one of the cases that she actually challenged Arling Sugden over and said they have the, that the family have contacted you numerous times. The mother said to you numerous times, I'm really fearful for what my son's going to do. No response from the child maintenance service. No response whatsoever. So what they do is they hold an internal review process when a client is what they call you takes their own life and she categorically stated that they find most of the time in the internal review process that the cms is not responsible for that person taking their own life she made quite a bold statement by saying that their clients most of them are in a load of debt anyway that's quite a flippant response. Then Viscount Younger, who's just taken the position of Undersecretary of State, he said something quite contrary to that. And that's where I'm quite disturbed about different accounts, different stories that's coming from the top. And Viscount Younger said that he's just taken the position and he's read a lot of cases that have resulted in tragic circumstances. And he said the processes need to be in place to stop people from taking their own lives. So who do you think is being dishonest? So she says because he's in other debt, it's not child maintenance problem. Exactly. And they carry out an internal review process. Is that not like marking your own homework? It's sad to think because we're not well know suicides on the rise and people are struggling. But that extra, when you get a debt letter and it's got the red writing and it's it's bold and and they're consistent, it does break people down. Understand? Look, people are chasing money, and if you fucked a bill or if you fucked something, then people want their money. But it's just the powers that they have. They are ruthless. They are. It's ruthless how. But that bill you've agreed to, that bill that's come through your door, you know what that bill is. The bill that comes through from the child maintenance service or the child support agency, you've got no idea. And the difference is, is that, you know, bills, whether it's with a bank or your mortgage company or whatever it might be, they are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. From what I can see, there is nobody that's regulating the child maintenance service. How does it, if the parents agree... Because they're supposed to then just let you be if there comes exactly. an agreement. Mm -hmm. But I still get, for I still get text messages to say, "Oh, payments due or whatever." But I'm not dealing with them. I pay direct. So how does it? How does it work when, if a parents come together like you say, if two parents come together, then should they all stop? A hundred percent. Because you, you know, when are we going to start treating people like adults? Yeah, you, you, you know, that's an adult decision, isn't it? To have a child. It, for me, maybe I'm old school, maybe I'm a bit of a dinosaur, I don't know. But that's a big decision. To produce a child is a big decision. And a child should never be produced for financial benefit. And currently the systems in place support that effort. The more children you have, the more money you can claim. Since when has that been right? Maybe I'm old school I don't, I, I don't know yeah. you know if you if you decide to have a child both parents are equally responsible for that child financial schooling health whatever it might be both parents are equal shouldn't be one that dic dictates more than the other but the system currently supports that Let's touch on the suicides again because I think mm -hmm. it's important for a lot of people who are arguing through this process and who are struggling, who don't see a way out because of the pressure and the bank accounts getting frozen, taking more money than they should. How is there anything in place for anybody to get help or seek help or where do they turn to? Samaritans, that's about it really. What about lawyers? No. That's more money I know as well. Yeah, solicitors, because there's no legal aid assigned to child maintenance, any legal profession that you contact, they're just not interested. They'll just say, sorry, can't help you because there's no legal aid. There's nothing in it for them. 
But it's interesting that you talk about the suicides because um, I want to talk about the Brian Hudson report. And Brian Hudson, through FOIs, which is uh, the freedom of information, yeah? So what you can... Do you know about freedom of information and why it's there and that? I don't know why it's there, but the Freedom of Information Act? Yeah, so it's, it comes under the Freedom of Information Act, which is where you can request certain data from government bodies, mm -hmm. yeah, to make them more transparent, basically. Think, what did I get? I think I've done that with... with my. My lawyer done that for me, I think, for all my court cases and stuff. Freedom of Information Act. I to see to it. see what data they hold on yeah, you. Yeah, everything. And yeah. if there was any like, surveillance and all that. Years ago it was. They kept, they've got to be, not, I don't know if they'll be 100% honest, but they had to give all the information that was on me, whether it was surveillance, the time I was in prisons, every time I was arrested, they gave me everything, all photos of stuff, me and police cells. So that's more subject access request. Subject access request yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's so, yeah, 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 yeah. So so that's all the data that's held on you yeah. by that department. By the police that was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what freedom of information is, is there for is to obtain data held by those government departments. Hmm. Yeah. So what happened with Brian Hudson, he carried out a study um, between 2017 and 2020 um, and Brian is an expert with data. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's phenomenal with data and his calculations. So what he did, he obtained data from what do they know? And that was direct from the CMS. So it was the data that the CMS, so it's undeniable, indisputable data that has come from the child maintenance service. And in that data, he found between 2017 to 2020, he had found that 1,013 paying parents with arrears were dead. 1,013 paying parents. Let that just sink in for a minute. That is a substantial figure. And he obtained, obtained that data from the child maintenance service. And then he also carried out another study. And this is all life expectancy. So he worked to a table of life expectancy. So it could be like from 18 to 25, what is the life expectancy of somebody to live, you know, 18 to 25, then from like 25 to 40. Yeah, you know, like, like mm -hmm. those tables. So that was the study that he carried out. And with receiving parents, it was something like 1%. But with paying parents with arrears, it was 14 times more. And when COVID came, when the pandemic came, enforcement dropped by 28%. Why? Because obviously they weren't there to enforce certain things because, you know, all government departments were closed down, um, et cetera, et cetera. He then did a further FIY after 2020. And he obtained the data from them there again. And the death rate had fallen by 27.5%. So enforcement had seized by 28%. And the death rate had fell by 27.5%. Because there wasn't pressure on... Because there wasn't the enforcement process of what was happening. So the data would suggest that there is suicides you know, we would, you know, the data would suggest that, that paying parents are taking their own lives. And it has been highlighted in pu public accounts committees. It has been highlighted in other areas, but it's just ignored. It's just ignored by the government. It's ignored by the DWP. It's just ignored by everybody. This is a massive, massive problem. It's, it's, it's a, a, such a huge problem. This is, then we look at the National Audit Office. Do you know who the na National... No. Right, so the National Audit Office, they're the regulators. Mm -hmm. So they regulate all government departments. And since the inception of the Child Maintenance Service, the National Audit Office, every single year, have refused to sign off the accounts of the Child Maintenance Service based on inaccurate maintenance assessments. The maintenance assessments that they've carried out are not in line with child maintenance legislation. 
and they are refusing to sign off the accounts based on the fact on the 1993 and 2003 schemes that it is inaccurate maintenance assessments that have been carried out. Joshua Redway, from who is the director of the National Audit Office, in March 2022, in the same public accounts committee hearing, he categorically stated that parents are being pursued for debts where there is no evidence to substantiate that they owe that money. Yeah, it's mad. Even for the when the lockdown came and the everything dropped with the suicide for people who pay child maintenance, it's sad to think that people are taking a leave from it. See, if you go to prison for the six weeks, did they wipe the bill? No. No? No. It's usually, I, I don't I think it was oh, seven days in Berlin back in the day for a fine, but as soon as I was out, the fine was gone. So if you do prison time, you're still obligated to mm. pay what you're owed. Mm. And they'll come after you again. So the only it? thing that they can't do is put you in prison because then that's double jeopardy, isn't it? So they can't put you in prison more no, than once? No, but then they've got all the other enforcement powers still. Do you get a fine or anything for going to prison or going no. to court? Do you go to court for it and then they send you to prison or can they just take you straight to prison? Just like they just shut your bank accounts down and just freeze everything. Can they just come to your door? Or do they not get that sort of power? They've got to go through the courts. <laughs> well, a couple of things here that, that we're going to talk about is currently at the moment, there's a case in the High Court, which is the Declaration of Incompatibility. Yeah, do you know what? No, explain that, please. Right, okay. So a Declaration of Incompatibility is regarding human rights and the way that human rights are being violated. So in the Child Support Act 1991, section 33, subsection 4, it precludes the magistrate from checking the calculations of the child maintenance service. So in essence, what that means is that when you go to court, whatever figures are presented to that court, the magistrate will, will punish you regarding those figures. The magistrate has its hands tied. They cannot check those calculations that those calculations are in, uh, that they are correct. But we know that these calculations are incorrect because the National Audit Office, who are the regulators and the auditors, every single year refuse to sign off the certificate of efficiency based on the calculations and the figures that the child maintenance service are producing. Why is that? How is that being allowed to happen? I mean, is that a complete failure that the judiciary are not checking what's going on with the DWP? Is it a complete failure? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. It just seems all messy. And how can people check up on the facts and the figures and the names that you're saying here? Can people look up on that and just kind of look into it more in detail also and just confirm everything? Yeah, of course they can. Um, you know, we'll we'll publish the links where everybody can see what I've spoken about today regarding the child maintenance service is all evidence-based. You asked me a question earlier. Is this, you know, who who who's running this? Who's running this business? That I can't answer. And if I knew the answer to that, I would certainly say it. Have you heard of a company called Serco? Serco? Yeah. How the fuck do I know that name? Because I'm they're sure in our I've lives. Had, I'm sure I've had letters from them. Well, they're in our lives every single is day. Is that a private company? Yeah, it's a private yeah, yeah, company. Yeah, 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 yeah. And do you know who the CEO is? No. Rupert Soames. Do you know who Rupert Soames is? No. Winston Churchill's grandson. Okay. Do you know who Nicholas Soames is? His brother. His brother, yeah. But do you know who he is? No. All right, okay. So he's a conservative MP. Mm -hmm. So one would ask the question, how are Serco securing all of these contracts? So they've got the Border Force contract. Uh, is that they, debt? Sorry? Is that debt? No, Border Force. So oh, the, so, the oh, illegal immigrants yeah, 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 that are all yeah, coming yeah, across. Yeah. So Border Force are picking them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Serco are housing them. How do I know that name? Serco? Serco? I'm sure. They not, can they collect debt? Uh, probably. I, 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 I don't know. I haven't looked into them that much. But they had, because we had that in Glasgow, but it changed to, I think, G4. Because they used to have the, the transits for prisons. Mm -hmm. Now we're now we're getting into the nuts and bolts of this, yeah. So Serco, they have had the contract since 2008 of the Child Maintenance Enforcement Commission contract. 
And in 2015 to 2017, they were awarded, extended the contract of £47 million. The Child Maintenance Enforcement Commission. How on earth has a corporation, a, 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 a corporate company, got statutory powers? How on earth has that happened? That they hold that much power? And Serco published a press release in 2015 saying that they collected a billion pounds. Was this a billion pounds of the 3.8 billion pounds that's never been owed? Because we know that figure doesn't exist. It's been confirmed in many transcripts, in oral hearings, that that 3.8 billion pounds is not owed. But they're continuing to collect this money. That is not owed. And that is the reason why Sir Alan Campbell has asked for a public inquiry into what's going on. Then you look at who else is involved with the child maintenance service. And you just said their name a minute ago, G4S. Apparently they run the administration side of it. Then there's another company called Tata. And Rishi Sunak has financial involvement with Tata. They run the computer systems of the child maintenance service. I mean, what do you think is going on, James? It just seems as if it's all linked. It just seems as if it's big business. Well, there's a lot of money to be made. They make up private companies. They can go down the rabbit hole, looking at BlackRock, who are massive all around the world. There's so many, so much darkness. But again, I'm not clued up enough, but I can only give my opinion. It just seems if there's money to be made, if you're involved in politics, if you're mentioning those names like Churchill, his grandson or whatever, they're going to have some sort of power where they can run these private companies and collect debts that maybe are not there or they are there and making some extra money and then taking the extra money. But what that money they're collecting, they'll start taking extra money from the parents. So it covers that, covers costs. So what they'll do is just use the the normal, the average human being and just fucking bleed them dry for their own greed, their own power. I don't have all the answers to it, but there's, I know enough big corporations and big businesses who you hear I've not got all the paperwork but I can only hear and, and speak to enough people and watch a few videos and think well that's a bit dodgy there but I know G4 and that's what it must so that's what I must know that from that connection it's just all paperwork businesses okay we'll make up a business we'll sign this but yeah how do we get more money out of these people that's it we'll just we'll put more pressure on them say they're making this amount it's just greed at the end of the day it all comes down to greed but for all these people that's working on it then and they've got that power. Who's signing for the power? Is it some that inside the government who's given them the, f the free role to then be collecting something that doesn't exist? Yeah, again, that's a, another very interesting point that you've just raised there. Who is benefiting from this? Who 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 is benefiting from all of this money? I You know, I, I couldn't honestly say. But I do know that in tw since 2019... The child maintenance service gave the treasury nearly 850 million from the 1993 and 2003 schemes. So of a billion pounds that was collected, 850 million was given to the treasury and only 1.12 million was given to receiving parents out of a billion pounds. But £850 million that was given to the Treasury of a debt that's never been... Uh, I keep saying it. We know that that debt is a fictitious debt. So why are they collecting this money and giving the money to the Treasury? So you're talking about 98%, 97% going to our Treasury and the parents only getting... 1.12 million. Basically less than 1%. Exactly. Nearly a billion. Exactly. So when you asked me earlier, do the receiving parents get the money... They get a bit, but in terms of what they're collecting, they get nothing. And that's what I'm saying to you. It's now become big, big business, yeah. a state regulated big business to make money. But if you start taking food away from these people's mouths, then you become a target. So mm -hmm. you speaking out like this, do you feel as if you can become a threat? Just beginning of speaking out in higher places now and going, well, wait a minute, this name's here. Where's that billion pound went? Because it's, it's a system where it's a good system for them. Because when it comes to kids, they've got that there. We talk about kids being used as tools. 
The government are using them as a tool. With everything you're saying is correct, they're using kids. Well, wait a minute. Nobody likes to speak out when it comes to kids and people think, well, the parents should be paying this and that. But if there's corruption there and there's a billion pound going missing, if there's 3.8 billion, where is that? Then there's got to but be what questions. is wrong with speaking up? Nothing. You see that you see this is this is the thing. What is wrong with speaking up? What's happened with the inquest? The inquest with the guy who's wanting to look into it. Oh, you mentioned his name earlier. Right. So is that a possibility of people looking into it, or will it just get swept under the carpet? It has been swept under the carpet. It has in the case of Gavin Briggs, and in the case of Johnny O'Neill, it's already been swept under the carpet. When Ian Briggs attended court, public uh, coroner's court, the coroner stated the CMS, I'm refusing to listen to any evidence in relation to the child maintenance service. That is the coroner's job, to listen to the evidence, to determine how that person has come to take their own life. That is the coroner's, that's his job. And he stated in a public court that he's going to refuse to listen to any evidence regarding the child maintenance service. So it's like banging your head against a brick wall. So It is banging your head against a brick wall. But paying parents are paying the ultimate sacrifice. And all we get in the media, and that's what I'm highlighting it on both parts, I'm just impartial to all of this. I've looked at receiving parents. Receiving parents are not getting the money that they should be. And I've just clearly stated that mm -hmm. by saying of this debt that's been collected, only 1.12 million pounds was paid to them. The rest of it was paid back to the treasury. And I can't understand that. That bit, I, I, I can't get my head around because that bit has never been owed to the secretary of state. These are just facts and figures that are all out there in the public domain. And I've just looked at them. That's all that I've done. I don't listen to what the news say, you know, Every time you hear anything about the child maintenance service, we're going after deadbeat dads. That's just propaganda. All these fathers and all these mothers are all paying for their children. They're paying. Hence the reason why they're called a paying parent. And the reason why the receiving parents are not getting the money because the non-resident parent is so busy trying to fight the system of these arrears that they've been getting on their accounts. So that just going round and round and round in circles. And until there's a, a public inquiry into what is actually going on, where the money's going, making it transparent, nothing at all about a child maintenance service is transparent. And it's got to be transparent the same way that the court process has to be transparent. Any public body, any government body has to be transparent. This is what we're electing our officials to do. You can't sit back in, in, in a web of secrecy and stuff like that. We've, you know, society has moved on from that, the cloak and dagger days. We have to become transparent. We've got to start reducing this regulation and let people live their lives and grow up. Everybody makes mistakes. We've all made mistakes. My God, I've made hundreds of mistakes in my life. Yeah, what's your mean? Yeah. You know, I'm a human being, just the same as anybody else. But we've got people who are going to Eton, and I'm not saying that they're any less or, or whatever, but they haven't lived real lives and they're making these laws. They're not getting up every single day, battling the traffic, going to work, getting these bills come through the door, you know, which are really stressful with the cost of living crisis and stuff like that. And like I say, the child maintenance service are pumping this propaganda. Oh, we're chasing feckless fathers deadbeat dads that's all that you hear to let the public believe that all fathers just don't pay for their children but we're going to force them to pay for their children all of the, all, everybody that i've interviewed and everybody that i've spoken to and read their case studies james they're all paying for their children whether it was a private arrangement whether it was this or whether it was that and like what you're experiencing you're paying for your children and the child maintenance service is still harassing you in some way why is that allowed? Yeah. How did, did you ever sort it out with them when you were going through everything that you were going through? So what I did is I sent them my tax return of what it was for that year. I mean, I went through all the appeals process. I went through uh, the independent case examiner and the ind independent case examiner actually ruled in my favor mm -hmm. and said that they never carried out a mandatory reconsideration. 
they said they never carried out a mandatory reconsideration, which is when they make an assessment, if your income has changed by uh, more than 25%, they have to reduce um, that amount to whatever it might be. Yet again, it was just all ignored, ignored. And the independent case examiner actually ruled in my favor. The DWP got in touch with me and they said, oh, we'd like to pay you £75 compensation. But then they carried on with the same figures. They never made the adjustments. So when they were going to send me to prison, I sent them my um, my tax return and they know that it's an, a lot less. And, and that, at that point, I never heard back from them again. But I still have this fictitious debt out there that allegedly I owe. Can that affect your credit rating? Yes, they can place it on your credit file. So the reason why I stopped paying for my daughter was because my daughter was involved in a high profile case where the stepfather and the mother were arrested. This is in the public domain as well. They were arrested for the suspicious death of the grandmother and child protection services got involved, et cetera, et cetera. Then when I started reading the police reports and the statements, the stepfather categorically stated under police interview, if I had more money, I would do more drugs. And he admitted to doing cocaine three to four times per week. Well, surely that puts my daughter at risk. I provided that evidence to the child maintenance service. Yet again, all ignored. We only administer child support. That's all we do. But section two of the Child Support Act says something completely different. So where does it say that? So this is what I'm saying. In our every single day lives, the legislation that's being put through of this high regulation, they only pick the bits that they want. The law is either the law or there's no point having the law. You can't just pick the bits that suit you or we don't like that bit because we can't collect the money. The reason why that's there, section two, the welfare of the child, is because it is the welfare of the child to stop things like that. So if a child is being brought up in a crack house, that is what section two is there to do to protect the child. Yeah, I see some dads who, listen, they try and do whatever they can not to pay any maintenance but then also on the other hand I see a lot of dads who the mother tries to get whatever they can and the money doesn't seem to go to the kids they're all cutting about in the designer clothes and having their nights out at the weekend so I see both sides as well but what happens if like you say is there the mother was an addict she was an alcoholic or mm. she was addicted to drugs but you're paying something you know the kids maybe at the grandparents she's not spending the money on the kids how is there anything in place for the father to know well, the money's going, like receipts are... So that child that can be made a financial ward of court, but the CMS will not allow you to get that to court because they will carry out their enforcement process. So if you provide the evidence to the child maintenance service and you say, my daughter's at risk, you can provide the evidence that that child is at risk or is vulnerable to drugs or whatever it might be. Of course, you still need to pay for the upkeep of that child, but it needs to be done in a responsible way and regulated way. That's when regulation is supposed to come in. Not in our everyday lives, but that's where regulation should be used in something as serious as that. You know, drugs destroy people's lives in one way or another. I've known a lot of people who've taken drugs over the years. Come on, I run a scaffold company. Scaffolders are the worst for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, scaffolders are the worst for it. The fuckers are born at the now. <laughs> <laughs> and all I see is people who do drugs, they don't do well out of it. Yeah, of course. And that, and that is, you know, the bottom line. But are people turning to drugs, are they turning to alcohol because of the pressure of the state? I think pressure of life in general as well. But it added extra pressure of getting your wages took off you and just paying for a kid that you're maybe paying too much and where's the money going? There's a lot of facts and figures to look into. So see when they're taking money, mm -hmm. so say they take my wages mm -hmm. and they t if they give the ex-partner money, does she know how much she's getting or does she just get a slice of whatever the child maintenance giver? Right, so my understanding is of this is that when they produce a statement it's not like a bank statement where you can see what's coming in what's going out the other end 
and the balance in the middle because that way they'd never be able to add arrears. So until they produce a full set of accounts and full statements of exactly what's coming in, what's going out and the balance, the same way that the banks do, the same way that your car finance does, loans, etc. It's a full statement, isn't it? It's quite easy to understand. Mm -hmm. But the way that they're showing these statements, nobody knows. So, I mean, off the back of that, if you said to me what positive, any positive outcomes from this, I would say that non-resident parents, resident parents, put your differences aside, no matter what it is, and communicate with each other and get to the bottom of exactly the amount of money that he's been paying or she's been paying or what he's been receiving. And then you can determine and put your case together and, and use the correct channels. Start highlighting this. People have to stand up for themselves because the state are just going to keep using the legislation and let, and it's okay to say no. And since when have we just accepted as the queen's subjects, as the king's subjects, that corruption is okay? We've now come to accept it in our lives. Oh, it's okay to be corrupt because they're just doing it and it doesn't really affect me. So I'm not really that bothered about it. But if you've got children, this can affect your children at any time. Your son or your daughter could meet the wrong partner and before you know it, their life is turned upside down and destroyed. So we've got to get people mm -hmm. to communicate and that's what we need people to do and that's what we need to promote is communication is absolutely key. Go to meditation, whatever it might be, sort your differences out and find out who's paying what and who's receiving what. Because none of these figures are, ad, uh, are adding up. The National Audit Office are clearly stating every single year that there, there's overpayments. Under, and it's not like £10 or £20. This is millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. There's like overpayments of £11 million, underpayments of £20 million. You know, we could sit here and say, OK, it might be a clerical error if it was a couple of hundred quid, but this is millions of pounds. Do you feel as if it would be beneficial for both parents to get together where the mother would make more money and the dad would save more money because you're cutting out the middleman who's bleeding people dry and putting the pressure on them? Exactly. Exactly. I know a million percent that receiving parents complain as much about the system as what non-resident parents do. But unfortunately... Receiving parents are not taking their own lives as a result of what, of the child maintenance service actions. They might be leaving them in maybe a bit of poverty or short of money or short of bread that week. But non-resident parents are taking their own lives as a result of these incorrect maintenance assessments. And the pressure. And the pressure of enforcement. You're talking about corruption. What sort of corruption is involved? What sort of tactics do they do to the parent? Well, in 2022, there was a case deletion of cases that they had deleted from the 1993 and 2003 schemes to the value of £78 million, pounds, where they'd actually deleted case files. The National Audit Office, you know, were very, very vocal about that, that they had deleted case files to that value. And the long and short of it is, is that the National Audit Office, where they keep saying that it's overpayments, underpayments, misstated. Misstated means errors, constant errors, errors, errors. This is what keeps flagging up with the National Audit Office. But deleting data, that's a criminal offence. That is 100% a criminal offence. Oh, yeah, you're deleting evidence. Exactly. But deleting data is a criminal offence. And I think under FCA regulations that any financial institute that they have to hold data, for, I, I, it might be from seven to 10 years or something like that in the archive. They can't delete case files, programmes or whatever it might be. But the child maintenance service have. Mm -hmm. And Peter Schofield said, oh, 
so Peter Schofield is the uh, he is the main civil servant of the DWP. He's like their highest ranking civil servant, and he has said, "Oh, we've got process in place now where case files can't be deleted." Well, that's just not good enough, is it? That's a lot of money, yet again, seventy-eight million, a value of seventy-eight million pounds. Just disappears. Just gone, disappeared. What are you hoping to get out of this interview today, No. I want to raise awareness. What I also want is resident parents and non-resident parents to put their differences aside and get to the bottom of who's paying what. Because I know many times that paying parents are saying, I'm paying what they're telling me to pay. But the receiving parent is saying, I'm not getting that money. And consistently saying that they're not getting that money. So where is that money going? I've, I, I don't know where that money is going. The National Audit Office doesn't know where that money is going. And that's what I want. And I want people to come forwards as well. And w I'll give the website that people can get in contact with. And what we want is people to come forwards who have been affected by the Child Maintenance Service and the Child Support Agency and this goes back to 1993. And what we really, really want is people who have unfortunately lost loved ones to come forwards and supply us with that data. Of then what we need is their name, date of birth, and the date of their death. Then we can determine how many suicides have been caused by the child maintenance service. And that's the data that we want to collect. What happens if you've got all that data and people make a stand? But what's the next steps to then try and get an inquest to look into it and see if there's corruption to see the figures don't add up? How does people then make that happen? Well, then there has to be pressure put on the police. With that data, the pressure has to be put on the police to get the right warrants, to conduct the right investigation into what exactly is going on. Where is this money going? Who is the recipients of all of this money? And why a debt of £3.8 billion, which we know is fictitious. I mean, if you look at the Fraud Act 2006, inflating incomes, that is a fraudulent action by doing that. So why, why are the police not looking at this? Why are people not taking this a lot more seriously than what it actually is? It's a, it's a huge, huge problem. And I just don't understand why people are just not paying attention to it in the high places. But for anybody watching who's feeling that pressure, who's feeling that struggle, who feels as if something ain't right with the child maintenance service, what advice would you have for them? Where can they turn to? How can they speak to you? Where's the links for people to look up on it and try and get some help to ease the pressure? <sighs> Yeah, again, that's a very, very interesting question that you've just asked me there. There isn't support out there for non-resident parents who are under that pressure. But the only thing that I can say is that when you're under a lot of pressure, and no matter what's going on in your life, that pressure will always pass at some point. And people, you know, who tragically take their own lives as a result of it there are other options and all i can do is ask people to reach out speak to whoever it is stand up to the child maintenance service what, what what's that old saying whoever shouts loudest gets heard mm -hmm. use the correct channels that are there if you've been inaccurately assessed and there's an order that's out there for you look at the judicial process, you know, look at getting your case into a judicial review, look at getting it into the court of appeal, the high court, whatever it might be, and get it out of the, 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 this system that you're in, where you can't appeal. The appeals process that you go through fails and it fails dramatically. The only way that people can appeal against these uh, inaccurate maintenance assessments, assessments is going through a tribunal. But that's the tribunal that they steer you towards. 
ICE, which is the independent case examiner, you're lucky if they'll hear your case for up to three years. So the whole system's failing from top to bottom. And in this, when the system's failing, the child maintenance service are going to carry out their enforcement. That happens quite quickly. Literally, I, I would say from the time that they write to you within four weeks, they'll start their enforcement process against you. Yeah, it's fast. It is fast. Where do you go forward with the future with it all? I think, obviously, I'm a parliamentary candidate for reform. Um, obviously, this is not, I'm doing this off of my own back. Um, you know, this is not a reform policy at all. And I want to be quite clear about that. Um, it's just something that we have to keep talking about, keep talking about and not go away. And eventually, change will have to come. What is reform for people who don't know? Reform? What are they? What What do I think reform is? Yeah, for people who don't know what it is. It's a political party. Um, we're doing currently very well in the polls at the moment. And if you ask me what do we stand for, I would say common sense. We're a common sense party. That's what we fucking need nowadays, mate. And all the common sense seems to be out the window and it's trying to normalise all the madness. People, the thing about human beings, we can be dumbed down quite easy. We can be manipulated quite easy and it's just to stay open-minded. Just look at every angle, question all, question what you're saying, question what I'm saying. We don't have all the answers. We just speak what we kind of learn through life and, and that's okay, but just question everything. If you're struggling with child maintenance, if you feel, and it hits the nail on the head, we go, well, wait a minute, I didn't know that. I can look into this further. In fact, I can just try and be an adult with my ex-partner and, and try and put the heads together and come to some sort of agreement where we're not getting the piss took out of us. For anybody, like I say, what's your social media and links and stuff for anybody that's maybe wanting to ask questions or get involved with you? Do you have any links? Yeah, I've, I've got the links and I will, obviously, you know, people have access to those links. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that will be down the bottom. Um, but you know what? It's, it's quite interesting. You know, being with Reform, I've met some amazing people, really, really supportive of, the work that I do. And that's what I've received is a lot of support, you know, from reform. Um, you know, the people I've met are absolutely amazing. And I never, never in a million years did I think that now I would be involved in politics. And what I would say to anybody, you know, if you want to make that change, do what I've done. I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm just a guy that's come from, you know, a council estate, who's worked his way up, who's worked incredibly hard, created an own biz his own business. I'm no different to anybody else. I haven't been to Eton. I haven't been to Oxford. I haven't been to Cambridge. But I think anybody who's looking to get into politics nowadays to make that change, you just have to come into it with a common sense approach because we're hearing so much madness and nothing's making sense. And that's what we need. And I think that's what the public want at the moment is just people who live life. People who make laws, who li have lived life, who understand the struggles. And that's what I kind of want out of this interview is for people like me to come forwards where you want to make that change. That's why I got involved in politics, because I saw something that was completely wrong, something that was completely unjust. So I wanted to make a change. And the only way that you can make a change and get yourself a voice is by doing it politically. Mm. No, for coming on today, how are you feeling? I was a bit apprehensive. Obviously, when I came in today, I've done you know some interviews before. I've d obviously I've done an interview with Alex Reed, mm -hmm. great guy. Yeah, I like Alex, mad yeah. bastard. I like him. He's a funny <laughs> man. Heart, but you know heart in his sleeve. You see the sensitivity with him, man. But what a fighter he was back in the day as well. Great fighter, Absolute great warrior, great, great mixed martial arts fighter. But you know, more importantly, with Alex, he's very pure. Mm -hmm. He's very from the heart and Alex has been such a huge support to me. You know, he fully backs what I'm doing. He fully agrees with what I'm doing because obviously he's had his own fight, you know, in the family courts and stuff like that. And he's seen that injustice as well. So, you know, he's been a massive, massive support to me, Alex. You know, he's, he's a good friend. Um, you know, we're pretty close. And I, I genuinely think, you know, that he's a great guy. He really is. Yeah. So, listen, for coming on today and 
and saying everything you've said. Hopefully it can open doors. Hopefully you can get an inquest. But would you like to finish up on anything else for today? Okay, so... Or do you want to go over just all the bullet points yeah, that you've I'll said just, to refresh yeah. people's memory? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. So we've established that the debt of £3.798 billion pounds was created through interim maintenance assessments. We now know that parents are being pursued for debts where there's no evidence to substantiate that they owe that debt. The National Audit Office have confirmed that. Yeah, if you think back, Joshua Redway, when I spoke about him. Hmm. We've also established that there's a lot of data out there regarding paying parents taking their own lives in comparison to resident, sorry, receiving parents who are the recipients of the money. We also know that Sir Alan Campbell has asked for a public inquiry, which has just been swept under the carpet. We don't hear any of the mainstream media talking about it or highlighting that paying parents are being pursued for debts and being forced to pay money that they just don't owe. And what I want out of this is for non-resident parents and receiving parents to come together and start talking out their differences and come to amicable agreements with maintenance, but also find out who's been paying what and who's been receiving what. Because we've also established that the National Audit Office cannot sort out the accounts of the Child Maintenance Service. And we also know that they've refused to sign off the accounts of the Child Maintenance Service. Listen, thanks for coming on today and telling your story. Hopefully it can open up some doors. Hopefully there is an inquest and hopefully fathers can and mothers can sort things out and try and live a happier life and be better parents and sort things out and just... Everything just seems messy. That seems messy of the child service. It just seems if everything that you're saying is legit and just how fucked up and corrupt it can be. And it's scary to think that innocent boys are taking their life for pressure for a company which seems to be making money from people's pain and misery. So, listen, come on, Dave. I appreciate it. I wish you all the best for the future. And, you know, if anything I can ever help with, you know I'm here. Thanks a lot, James. God it's been a pleasure. Yeah, God bless you, you too.